Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. How wonderful it is that we can have a time together to look into the Bible. The Bible, which is the most important book in the world, a book which is so disregarded, so many people don't want to listen to the Bible. Of course, there's a big reason why they don't want to listen to the Bible. Uh, the Bible talks about sin, and sin is an ugly word in the lives of every human being because mankind and the Bible tells us this was created in the image of God intuitively he knows that sin brings judgment from Almighty God and that is an unacceptable thought that's an unacceptable idea and therefore why read the Bible why why read about all this uh, that which is so unacceptable they don't realize of course frequently that the Bible also tells us about the wonderful love of God whereby we can be rescued from that terrible disease of sin uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, no they don't get that far they just know that this Word of God is very very unhappy and therefore why be reminded unfortunately unfortunately simply to go into uh, denial simply to disregard the Bible as if it doesn't exist as if it has no importance does not change the fact that sin has to bring forth judgment that is the law of God that God has established whether we like it or not that judgment day is coming and therefore any human is far wiser if we uh, decide well then I want to know what I have to know I better learn about this while it, it is still the day of salvation and it is the day of salvation isn't that wonderful that it is the day of salvation and there are as a matter of fact a great multitude the Bible tells us so a great multitude which no man can number that are presently being saved but this is your program we want to hear from you so shall we take our first call tonight please good evening welcome to open forum hello yes good evening yes i just want to know more about the end of church age yeah what about the end of the church age yes i just want to know um, more about it you know well i'll I mean, tell you i'll tell you let me give you a perspective uh, the history of the world is geared or it is uh, identified with the unfolding of God's salvation plan and uh, for about 1500 years uh, the nation of Israel was the central focus of the gospel they are the nation that produced the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ came from the nation of Israel uh, and so for about 1500 years from the time that Israel came out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses until the time of Christ they were in the center of the of the uh, gospel program uh, but then and uh, and then when Christ came and finally when he paid for the sins of those that he came to save and then he went back to heaven God shifted the focus from the nation of Israel to the uh, local congregations okay, we call that we, we can call that the church age when all through the world local congregations were established with the purpose of acquainting the world with the Bible the Bible was completed uh, very shortly after Jesus went back to heaven and and now the church was uh, throughout the church age was given the responsibility of uh, of uh, sending that gospel into the world because God's salvation pl program called for those who are to become saved to hear the gospel and the principle was that faith that is a trust in the Lord Jesus would come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and the Word of God was the Bible 
and the local congregations were the given the uh, task of bringing that gospel to the world. Well, that went along uh, uh, more or less well, sometimes very, very poorly. Uh, and uh, But finally, there came a time when God was also finished with the local congregations, with that, with that method of sending the gospel into the world. Uh, for 1,500 years, it had been in the nation of Israel. And then for a little over 1,950 years, it had been the local congregations that sprang up all over, all through the world. And God shifted from them to individuals. And that coincided, that shift occurred uh, uh, about the time that the Great Tribulation began, that final terrible event that uh, is recorded in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 and referred to in many other places in the Bible like Revelation 13 and and uh, now for the final harvest of souls and God speaks of this in in Revelation 7 verse 9 I saw a great multitude which no man can number they were robed with white robes and when a question was raised, who are these robed with white robes, which is a figure of speech to indicate they had become saved, uh, the answer came uh, in verse 13 or 14, these are those who have come out of great tribulation. In other words, it's at, at the time, at the en out end of the church age, and not from outside of the local congregations, there's a great multitude that are being saved and that is what's happening in our time and the uh, and the uh, command to bring the gospel to the world no longer rests on a divine institution like the local congregation it, congregations it rests upon every true believer every true believer is to share the gospel or see to it that the gospel goes out and through this means there is a final harvest of souls that is going on presently and when that is finished and it will be finished very shortly then comes judgment day and the end of the world and now we this is all written out or, or there are many many passages in the Bible that relate to this are, are uh, put together in a couple of books that Family Radio has produced and is offering free of charge no charge whatsoever one book is the end of the church age and after the end of the church age and after and the other book is wheat and tares wheat and tares uh, which is uh, the title comes from the parable of the wheat and tares that we find recorded in Matthew 13 and those books will help anyone who's really interested in this question to search through the Bible to find out what the Bible has to say about these very very important matters that are ha, have taken place right in our time thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening Mr. Camping yes um, I've got a question for you um, in Isaiah uh, chapter 62 in Isaiah 62? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, in the very first verse, it says, for Zion's sake. What does the word, what does Zion mean in the Old Testament here? Let's look at it. And now, for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation there as a, a lamp that burneth. Zion is actually a synonym for Jerusalem. If you look at the word Zion or you look at the word Jerusalem, uh, in either case they are uh, externally representing the, the uh, kingdom of God that has, God has established. Uh, etern that is, uh, externally they were, uh, Zion is identified with Jerusalem. Uh, 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 of course the actual kingdom of God consists of those who are the true believers and and uh, and but in the Old Testament it was uh, the nation of Israel or Zion or Jerusalem or the temple or Judea 
or the land of Canaan. They were all uh, uh, local uh, places and, uh, that externally represented the kingdom of God. But once God was finished with national Israel, after Christ went back to heaven, then the Zion and Jerusalem and uh, Judea and uh, the temple and Canaan uh, and so on are uh, uh, re referring to the local congregations because throughout the church age they became the external representation of the kingdom of God. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, my uh, son has a question for you. Would yes. you uh, okay, hold on just a second. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Campion? Yes. Um, this is right after, um, um, like, God created the heavens and the earth and all that. Well, um, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to fall for the trick um, of Satan and a snake, why did he kill them? Why, why did he create Adam and Eve if he knew they would fall into sin? Yes, sir. Is that, is that your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, we ask that question, why did God allow that? Well, uh, it is, uh, uh, first of all, God did not create man to sin. God created man to serve him and to love him. And uh, the whole human race was in Adam and Eve, so when he created Adam, he effectively created the whole human race. Now, uh, however... Uh, it also, uh, uh, when, when man sinned, God's law declared that man had to pay the penalty for their sin, namely eternal damnation. Now, God knew, of course, that was going to happen. Now, getting back to your question, then you could ask, well, then why did God even create Adam? Why not? Why, why did he do that at all? Well, for two reasons. One reason, or at least two reasons we know about. There may be other reasons. But there are two reasons that we know. First of all, we know that God desired to have a people for himself eternally. Uh, that is, uh, uh, why God needed or wanted these people, that's, uh, that's something we don't know. But we know that there's a great multitude out of the human race that, that uh, God planned that they would spend eternally with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth and be used of him to reign with him, and that's what's going to happen to all true believers. Now, we don't know anything at all as to what, uh, uh, why God particularly desired this, but it, it was a, uh, an outstanding uh, piece of information when we learn that mankind was created in the likeness, in the image of God. So that when we're in heaven with him forevermore in the new heaven and the new earth, we read in First John that when we see him, we will know him because we will be like him. My, my, how, how, what does all that mean? But, on top, but then there's another huge reason. In the process of having these people for himself, it gave God an opportunity to demonstrate his marvelous attributes like his love and his patience and his kindness and his mercy and his wrath and his um, justice and his integrity and so on and so on. You see, it's one thing for God simply to say, I am a God of love. I am a God of mercy. He can say that. Uh, and that's true because God, everything God says is true. But it's another thing if he can dis demonstrate and to who? Well, all the principalities and powers that have existed from eternity past that we know nothing about and yet certainly are in existence somehow, uh, and he could de demonstrate to them uh, his love and his mercy and his grace and his patience and his wrath and his justice and, and so on and uh, do it in a way that, uh, uh, that is way, beyond, way far more significant than just saying that he is these things. And so 
uh, that's why the Bible emphasizes that we are saved to the praise of His glory. God, and we read in Ephesians 3 that the principalities and powers are, are uh, they, they, well, let me see how that reads. Let me read that a moment, find that a moment. We read in Ephesians 3 where he is saying in verse 10 as he's speaking about his salvation plan to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heaven, in the heavens, might be known by the church, that is, by all those who become true believers, the manifold wisdom of God. We don't know who these principalities and powers are, but certainly they are witnessing these grand attributes of God as they are demonstrated, they are shown in actuality as he works out his salvation plan. So it's it's a very complex situation and a very grand and wonderful situation of which we know very little about but ultimately it is all to the praise and the glory of God and when we get to heaven when we're with the Lord Jesus if we're a true believer we will be there then I'm sure that we will be able to know a whole lot more about this why why it was that God saved me for example my my I didn't deserve salvation at all and God had to save me and everyone else that he came to save at an enormous cost to himself but thank you for that good question and now shall we go to our next caller please good evening welcome to open forum yes brother Camping. how you doing very well thank you my my question is, it appears that today a lot of the churches are more interested in numbers of people instead of quality of believers. Why do you think that is? Uh, uh, who who is interested in numbers? Uh, churches. It just seems like churches do more and more uh, to get people in uh, programs and you know different types of music just to get people into the churches for, for, there are two reasons that well maybe there are more but there are two essential reasons number one they believe that in so doing they are being faithful to the Bible's command to share the gospel with others if they have 5,000 members isn't that wonderful aren't we being faithful to the Word of God in causing 5,000 people to be part of this congregation. And so spiritually, uh, these individuals, these churches can feel very good about this. The other thing is that normally churches try to have their membership become tithers, that is, give 10% of their income uh, for the support of the activities of the church. And so the more members, the more money, the bigger building can be built, uh, the more pastors can be available, the more, uh, uh, the more uh, 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 amenities can be offered of various kinds. And so it, uh, it, uh, it also becomes, and I say this rather cynically, I admit, it becomes some kind of a money machine on top of it, everything else. I agree with that. I mean, I just feel like um, there's a church that I go to, been going to for quite some time, and it it just seems like we don't even teach the word, the Bible, as much as we used to, and it um, I just it just very it grieves my spirit because stuff is watered down, sin is not really talked about, and it's just making people feel good. And How do you think the Lord feels about that when we don't declare the whole council, when we pick and choose? Well, this is what the end of the church age is all about. God's judgment now is on every local congregation, and he actually commands those who are within these congregations to come out of them because God's judgment is on them he's saying that those who remain there will uh, be, be are being prepared for the judgment throne it's an enormously dangerous place the Bible explains in 2nd Thessalonians 2 that God will give them a strong delusion to believe a lie and so anyone who remains in a local congregation 
is is in is endangering their spiritual life very greatly. Uh, uh, certainly, there is no blessing there because the Bible teaches very clearly that the Holy Spirit is no longer present there. He is no longer in their midst, uh, and therefore, however, whatever little or great the preacher uh, is still preaching the Word of God, it, it has no spiritual meaning to anyone within the congregation. So the answer is, come out. Don't, be, don't remain there if you're going to be faithful to the Word of God. Thank you very much for the camping. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. Yes, go ahead. Good, uh, good evening. Welcome yes. to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Canton. Yes. Um, I'm calling. I'm, like, curious. Like, recently, I became a child of God, and um, knowing that I am a child of God is that I personally cannot go back to the things that I used to do, which was sinning, like the things I did, right, excuse like me, fornication. Could you, excuse me, could you turn your radio off? We're getting a little okay. feedback. Can you hear me now? Yeah, let's try it. Go ahead. You, you, you Like now let fornicating. Us and stuff like that. I just can't go back to my sins. And, some, you know, like, this, the thing, the serious sins, I don't do anymore, but, like, like listening to the, the hip-hop and, um, um, listening to hip-hop and sometimes cursing, those are the only things that I do that I know is wrong in the eyes of God. And I'm just curious, does that, does that, does it deny me salvation because, I'm not, you know, that I'm certain things that I'm still doing. Well, now, let me explain some things. When we become saved, it isn't because we've become good enough or because we turned away from this sin or that sin. Uh, we, can, we can try to become as perfect as possible and still go to hell. You see, the problem is that... If we have only one tiny little sin in our life, just one, uh, if that has not been covered by the blood of Christ, it means we have to make the payment, and the payment is eternal damnation. So you can't become good enough to escape hell. Nobody can. You need a Savior. You need the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And when He becomes our Savior... It means that he has covered all of our sins, however bad they were or however tiny they were. Now we look to in God's eyes as if we do not commit sin because all the guilt has been taken by the Lord Jesus. Now, so, the evidence of having become saved, and that is, that is what we're, we strive to, that is what we desire with all our heart, that... I might become a child of God, that Christ might be my Savior. When that happens, there's an enormous transformation that takes place in our life. Before we're saved, both in body and soul, we like big sins and little sins. We, we li we're living for me. I am number one. When we become saved... In our soul, we receive a brand new soul or spirit essence in which we never want to sin again. So it's a, there's a big change in our life. Now that means that not only the big sins uh, are now repugnant to us because that is we hate them, we don't want to do them anymore because we're not comfortable with them in our new soul at all but also the little sins we don't want to do anymore. We, we are happiest when we are doing it God's way. And, uh, and if we do fall into a sin, we know that that sin too has been covered by the blood of Christ, but we, it makes us very, very unhappy. How could I do that? when uh, in my new soul I don't want to sin anymore. Even though I'm still living in a body, 
that still lusts after sin and and so uh, the potential to fall into sin is still there does that deny me my salvation i mean does it does it i mean because in my heart i believe that you know the old me is gone and and the lord has blessed me um with with a new spirit i mean you know in terms of if if you if you have become a child of god there right. has been a big change in your life, and it's a it will remain there. It will not go away. It okay. because it means that you have a real desire to do the will of God. The Bible has become more and more important to you. You want to learn what you anything you can from the Bible, and and you're going to be very uncomfortable whenever you fall into a sin, and and as you find that more and more you want to do the will of God, you will receive the assurance that I must be a child of God because otherwise I wouldn't have this intense desire to do the will of God. I agree. But, you know, my mother in Christ, she says to me, my mother in Christ, she always says to me that my situation is that uh, she said I'm a babe, um, I'm, 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 I'm eating, I'm drinking milk now. And I'm growing, and I'm growing in the Lord. Is that true? Would that be well, true? Well, you you have to remember that before we're saved, we know very little about the Bible. We certainly don't want to obey the Bible. We want to do our own thing. Right. Uh, when we become saved and we have a new resurrected soul, suddenly we don't uh, know every sin in our life. Suddenly we don't know the whole will of God. And so as we read the Bible, as we hear from the Bible, as we study, as we live out our life, we grow in grace. We, we learn more and more that this is sin. I don't know. I don't want to do that anymore. And later on, we learn that is sin. I don't want to do that anymore, therefore. And, uh, and so we grow in grace. And, and I'm Amen. still growing in grace. I mean, no one, no, we don't arrive. We don't, we're not we're not finished becoming more and more spiritual until right. Christ gives us a brand new resurrected soul on the last Amen. day. Well, thank you for calling and sharing your question, and now we're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with our open forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. That's good evening. Mm -hmm. Hot yes. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Yes, can um, you turn to Hebrews 6, 4 to 8? Yes. Will you explain that for me, please? Yes. Uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 8 is, uh, until our present time, was virtually impossible to explain because it has some of the most crazy language imaginable. I say that very carefully very uh, because it says if it is impossible I'm reading Hebrews 6 verse 4 it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance now that sentence as it stands appears to be totally contradictory to everything the Bible teaches because when we go into the Bible we find that Christ came for sinners and no matter how often we have rebelled how often we have rebelled how often we have uh, repented and then rebelled again the fact is that uh, finally we still can end up a saved person if, if because God uh, is, uh, is can save the most vile sinners imagine, sinner imaginable, and yet these verses appear to say that there's a, uh, somehow there could be those who have have been very close to salvation have become saved, and they've fallen away and they've lost it all. There's no more possibility, but in our day. As we understand the end of the church age, as we understand the fact that in the local churches all over the world, no exceptions, 
any, and it's in the local churches where they have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They've had the Bible there. They've had the Holy Spirit working there, saving people. They have tasted the good word of God and seen the impact upon people in their congregation as they, uh, as they have become children of God. But now that we're at the end of the church age and the Holy Spirit has abandoned the local congregations, no longer saving anyone, in those same local congregations, if anyone falls into sin and everyone there who is not saved will who is still not saved and that would make up most of the people there because they're refusing to obey God's command to come out uh, it means that there is no salvation for them there the holy spirit is not present to save them they are they are uh, 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 it's impossible to enlighten them. It's impossible to save them because the Holy Spirit has to do the saving. And, and unless they get out of that congregation and get into an environment that is outside altogether from under the authority of that congregation, only then will they find an environment where God the Holy Spirit is still working to save. And so this is the... The, uh, it is talking about our day, where, and it's talking about the, any and every local congregation. There is no forgiveness of sin any longer in those local congregations. There's no possibility of anyone becoming saved, a child or an adult, a preacher or an elder or anybody else becoming saved because the Holy Spirit is not there to save them. Hello? Yes, I see. Um, I have two more questions. Yes. Um, if everyone is a sinner and needs Jesus to be saved, what happened to all the people who lived before Jesus came? Well, you, you, that's a good question. You know, the Bible says that Christ is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth of the world our Christ is the great I am the ever-present one and so even though there was a point in time back about 2,000 years ago when Jesus actually had to endure physically and literally endure the wrath of God the equivalent of spending an eternity in hell on behalf of each one he came to save nevertheless the washing power of that act were, was already available from the time that man first sinned. So Abel, for example, who was a child of God, he was a son, the second son of Adam and Eve, he would have had his sins paid for by the Lord Jesus exactly as you or I if we have become saved. And so it was so of, true of Moses and of Enoch and of... Uh, of uh, Rahab the harlot and Ruth the Moabites and David and and others who did become saved during the Old Testament time. Oh, because I was a little bit puzzled because based upon what you said, I think um, yesterday or before yesterday, you said comparing to the Old Testament and the New Testament, less people were saved during the Old Testament. Well, that's a different matter. Now, the quantity... Uh, the, in so far as salvation itself is concerned, there's no difference. Uh, sin had to be paid for by the Lord Jesus, and and uh, they became a new creature in Christ exactly as we do. There's no difference whatsoever. But how many? Now, that's a different matter. It is true that as we study the Old Testament, and the Old Testament covers 11,000 years of history, we don't find great multitudes becoming saved at all. We, uh, we the, as I indicated, the largest number we have is the 120,000 who were saved uh, of the Assyrians when Jonah preached to Nineveh. But within Israel itself, which was the chosen nation, the largest number we find at one time is 7,000 uh, who had not bowed the knee to Baal, Baal being a heathen god. Uh, 
But in the New Testament, we find uh, uh, right at the very beginning of the church age, which began at Pentecost in A.D. 33, there, uh, uh, there were about 3,000 who were saved that first afternoon. And ever since then, throughout the uh, duration of the church age, which ran, which actually continued for exactly, as near as we can tell, 1955 years, there have been people saved all over the world, and a great multitude. And uh, and then, uh, the, then now God has shifted to the end of the church age, uh, 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 to the salvation going on outside of the local congregations, and probably today and and the few years that are left until Judgment Day, there will be more people saved than ever before in history uh, for one big reason is that the world's population has grown enormously bigger uh, in that we're now over six billion people and so uh, there are many of God's elect within these and God himself he says there's a great multitude which no man can number but God does not give us any numbers we can't say oh well, then there will be 5 million or 10 million or 2 million or, or whatever. We, 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 there's no way that we can know how many in actuality. I see. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Yes, uh, just speaking about that, there was only three that were saved in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and eight uh, souls saved in uh, Noah's uh, flood. Yes, yes, very, very tiny numbers uh, uh, that God is uh, using. Mr. Camping, my question tonight is, uh, now Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to come back during a, around a... The Feast of Tabernacles, right? So well, it's September. Have, well, he's going to come back sometime uh, at the end of the world, and there's a possibility that will be in the fall of of uh, 2011. But uh, which uh, which month and which day, I will not speculate about. Mr. Camping, my question is: Do we count seven or eight days when the Feast of Tabernacles is actually? There at the time. Because I do it does not say know. seven, eight days after. I do not know. But the I, Bible says it, Mr. Campy. Well, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days, but also it, as it illustrates that feast, it also speaks about the eighth day and ties it into the Feast of Tabernacles in some way. And I don't know the answers to that. And so I, I'm sorry, I cannot... If I get into a discussion about that, I will be speculating, and I don't want to speculate. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I have a question. Um, you talk about in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe in verse 4, where Satan is now sitting in the temple and that the Holy Spirit has been taken out of. Isn't the command also Revelation 18:4, where God has commanded us to come out of the church? Yes. Well, that was my question. Well, that is that you see Revelation 18, Revel, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 6, uh, 13, uh, Matthew 24, Matthew 13, Luke Revelation 17, 21, uh, Revelation 17, uh, Jeremiah, uh, chapter after chapter after chapter, Isaiah, many, many chapters, uh, and uh, Joel, and uh, we could go on and on. There are all kinds of chapters in the Bible that are dealing with the time in which we are now living question on the God and those that are going to be saved. This doesn't the Bible say of Zechariah, I believe it's 13, I believe it's verse 8, that he says he's not coming for the two-thirds of the world, he's only coming for one-third. Well, but that is not a, uh, a, uh, a number that we can, that's a symbolical number. He symbolically divides the world into those who are numbered, who are called two-thirds, and who are identifying with those who are not saved, and one third identifying with those who do become saved. But that is not that is not in any way an actual 
literal number. It, uh, it, uh, it would not agree with all the information we have in the Bible. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Camping. I, yeah. I was wondering if I could make a couple of comments and a question. What is your uh, comment? First of all, I want to thank uh, Family Radio for their ministry and praise the Lord for their their work that they have done. And uh, also thank them that they use the Bible as their authority. And uh, my comment is that now, I've listened to Open Forum for quite a while, and um, this teaching now is at about the end of the church age. I notice that there are many people calling in who are still affiliated with churches who are just plain nasty and mean. And they're very arrogant, and I think that we should all be like Daniel in chapter 9, verse 5. And I know there are those out there who have websites even to have family radio off the air. <clears throat> and which I find kind of funny because they all act like one man could end the church age. And if the church age is to end or is ended, that would be by God. And I saw something in the book of Acts, verse chapter 5. Verse 34. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. There we read. Then, there, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. And then he says uh, uh, in verse 38, he gives, he gives a couple of illustrations, and then he gives, come, comes to his conclusion. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. That is, it will be nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And that, of course, is wonderful wisdom. That comes from God himself. But unfortunately, when people are blinded, when people are, uh, their spiritual eyes are not open or not at all, they're not open to the Word of God. And they... They think they know better, and so I doubt whether this kind of advice would uh, prove anything to them. Shouldn't we be more like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11? They searched the scriptures to see if this were so. And that's what it should be, and that's why constantly I try to come back at them and say, please show me from the Bible. Show me from the Bible. And you made a good point there when you talked about the Bereans that effectively I'm asking then please search the scriptures to see if this is so and if you find something that shows that we're teaching wrongly please tell me I want to know so I can be corrected but unfortunately they're not about to search the scriptures they don't even know how to begin to look ordinarily and so that's the end of the conversation well, I noticed that many times they call and they um, want to make their point, but they rarely bring any scriptures, you know, with their argument. Yes. And uh, I, I think you're very patient with many of them. And um, I think for me, uh, I still am studying. Um, uh, I still have some problems with some of the teaching. But one thing that really stands out for me was... Uh, how God loved Israel and and did so many things for them, and then he he stopped um, giving his word to them. And I see that in Romans 11, verses 18 and 22. I think that's speaking about the churches well, instead of an it, individual. It's talking about an ancient Israel as a nation, as a people. And you are correct. 
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and if he was able to take a people like the nation of Israel, which he loved greatly as a nation, he raised them up uh, and watched over them and forgave them and uh, patiently worked with them and sent prophets and prophets and prophets to them and so on. And even the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching in their midst for three and a half years. So they were in the very presence of the Messiah and if he finally de disowned them so that they are no longer his chosen people at all and shifted to the local congregations, then uh, certainly we don't have to think it's impossible that God would do the same thing with the local congregations if they were not, uh, if, uh, if they began to become more and more faithless and turning away from the truth. Uh, and shift and 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 uh, begin to work with someone else that we should not be surprised at that I'm just very um, how can I uh, I want to use the word um, well, actually I'm terrified um, because I see verses in Romans 11 that says uh, in verse 18 boast not against the branches but if thou boast thou bearest not the root but the root thee thou will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed. lest he also spare not thee. Exactly. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also should be cut off. And I read that, and I just tremble. Well, we all should tremble, and you know, I, I uh, sometimes stand amazed at the patience of God with me, uh, and and uh, the ma amazed at the patience of God with the whole human race that He's continued uh, to uh, allow it to continue as long as it has. When we when we look around and we see the arrogance of mankind and the uh, as they despise God and and uh, act like there is no God and so on and so on and try to take all the credit uh, for themselves uh, in anything that they do you wonder how did God put up with it so long so long well the fact is God has a timetable that has to be worked out and but when that timetable comes to an end it's going to come to an end. And it is a fact that everything in the Bible focuses on the fact that we're probably right near the end. And, and Judgment Day is going to come, and it may very, very likely come in the next, uh, by the year 2011. Can I ask you my question now about Ruth? Yes. Um, um, I've been reading Ruth, and I just want to know if I'm, on, I'm maybe on the right track. I know that the last verse in Judges says in verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then in the first verse of Ruth, it says that they, uh, there was a man who, who uh, left because of a famine. Oh, Elimelech, yes. Elimelech. Could Elimelech be a picture of God? No, he's not a picture of God because he, uh, uh, well, no, I don't think so. I don't Because I remember you said he was, he was, his name meant God is king. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, it's been a lot, to be honest about it, I, I have not looked at the book of Ruth for years and years and years, and so I'm not really qualified to say. Uh, I, 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 I just, um, uh, I've been kind of looking at it again, um, and I think maybe it might have some teachings the about the end time. The, offhand, I would say the problem would be uh, uh, that Elimelech disobeyed God in that he left the land of uh, Bethlehem, uh, his home, and he went into the land of Moab uh, to escape the famine. And uh, I, I... I don't think that uh, I, uh, I... But I only compared him to Jacob. That's why I thought maybe... But you know, Jacob, Jacob was, left. 
Jacob was commanded by God to come into Egypt. Elimelech was not commanded to go into the land of Moab. Okay. But I, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I got to be careful because I haven't uh, done any homework on that for a long time, and I, and I could easily speculate and say some wrong things, and I'd rather not do that. Um, one last thing. One last thing, and uh, thanks for your patience. Just it's taken me a long time to to get a hold of you. Uh, verse eight in chapter of in the book of Acts, chapter eight, verse one. Could um, that be a picture of the church today, uh, where Acts. there's that many were scattered? Let's look at it. Let's let me take a look at that. Acts chapter eight. Eight verse one. And Saul was consenting unto his death, uh, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judah, Judea, and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried. No, that's not getting into the end of the church age. That In the book of Acts, that does not develop until we get to Acts 21. This is simply indicating in a very practical way how God is, is, uh, is uh, carrying out his program that the world is to be evangelized during the church age. And he utilizes persecution as well as the direct command, go ye into all the world. I just thought that it sounded similar to when Jesus said that at the end, many will put you into prison and cast you out. Yeah. Um, well, it is there is similar language, but uh, but the uh, I don't think the context, the overall context, will fit until we get to Acts 21, and then it begins to transition into the end of the church age, and and the uh, book of Acts uh, finishes uh, with the uh, picture of what is going on uh, during the uh, great the end of the great tribulation. Oh, thank you so much. You know, we we live here in Yuma, and it's uh, we we can't really. We're kind of like in the middle of San Diego and our, and Phoenix, and we can't get family radio on the airways, uh, so we have to rely on the internet. Uh, uh, you, you can try shortwave, or you can try the internet. Yes, but thank you for the opportunity. And, thank you uh, for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Um, I was wondering about the Judgment Day, where in the Bible it says anything about 2011. I keep hearing you saying about Judgment Day. Yeah. Oh, oh well, the Bible has a lot to say about that. But uh, one of the one of the statements that that comes through very clearly is Revelation 20, verse okay. Revelation 20, verse 11. And, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, I see that, but I keep hearing you saying that in the end of the world might be coming in 2011, what gives you, I mean, what makes you know how specific it is? That oh, well, there's a lot of, excuse me, there is a lot of information. Incidentally, I've, uh, there is just now available the book, Time Has an End, uh, and it is a, it is a uh, history, a biblical history of the world from its beginning in 11,013, to 2011, so it also oh. points uh, to the end of the world. Now, unfortunately, 
It can't, we, we are not giving it away, not to, because we want to make some money, but because we want to get it out in the marketplace where all kinds of people will, will uh, find it and, uh, and learn about the fact that we'd like to somehow get the message to the whole world, not just to family radio listeners, that mm -hmm. the end is almost here. And so it can be bought for a very reasonable price of $12.95, which doesn't give a family radio a nickel. We'll, we'll, we'll actually be adding a lot of money to that as we translate it in many other languages. But uh, it's so that uh, it is available to the general marketplace. Okay. I have another question. Hold on. Just, just hold on just a moment. I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're continuing at the Open Forum, and shall we take our call? Good evening. Yes. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Good evening. Um, I was wondering about the rapture. Yes. You know, does it happen before the Great Tribulation, or does it happen after? The Bible is very, very clear. It's on the last day, uh, and uh, the last day will coincide with the end of the Great Tribulation. The Bible, that timeline is very, very clear in the Bible. Uh, we read, for example, in John 6, verse 39 and verse 40, and two other verses, I will raise him up on the last day. And we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, that the believers will be resurrected at the time that Christ comes with the shout of command, and then we which are living will also be caught up with them to be with Christ in the air. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52, will not all sleep, but will all be changed. They're talking about the true believers in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye and so on. The evidence for the, for the rapture to be the last day is very, very great in the Bible. I, in fact, I'm really astounded that, that uh, somehow the churches uh, started talking about uh, the rapture occurring before the Great Tribulation or in the middle of the Great Tribulation or whatever. Uh, and uh, although I can I'll be very sympathetic about it because uh, these details of the end of the world have been uh, have not been given to the heart of man until this time. They were hidden from mankind, and so even though many of these men were dear children of God who loved the Lord and understood the authority of the Bible, yet God did not open their spiritual eyes as He is doing for people today. Okay. Um, can I ask you one last question? Yes. About Easter, yes. Um, does the Bible say anything about celebrating it, especially now that we're in the end times and the Spirit is not exactly in the church? The Bible doesn't say anywhere at any time that we are to celebrate Easter. There is no command. It is not a holy day uh, uh, insofar as uh, uh, the fact that Christ rose on that day. Uh, we do know that Christ rose on Sunday, and every Sunday, fi uh, every Sunday, uh, 52 Sundays in a year, are each of them are a holy day. And so Easter is one of these, uh, and therefore it's a holy day only because it's Sunday, not because it's Easter. And, uh, and the fact that... Uh, that someone wants to celebrate that specially. There's nothing in the Bible that says we should not do it, nor is there any command to do it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Camping. I, I have a question about divorce. In the Old Testament, God divorced Israel. Um, he, he allowed for divorce. I think it's Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. And then in, in the New Testament, Jesus rescinds divorce. Um, I believe Matthew 19. And also, God says that uh, a person who has been divorced cannot remarry. So uh, if, if the, the, the church is the bride of Christ, and I believe there's going to be a marriage in heaven, wouldn't that be God being a divorced entity? getting married again 
That's a very good question, but you see it's a different uh, entity, or, or let's put it this way, death enters, uh, death uh, permanently severs a marriage relationship. Remember in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, it says that a wife is bound by the law uh, to her husband as long as the husband lives, but if he is dead, then she's free to remarry because death uh, death ends that marriage relationship. All right. Now, when when uh, God was married to ancient Israel uh, uh, as a nation, now He married ancient Israel as a nation, and now He divorced them, and so He can never marry again uh, a nation like ancient Israel because that would be a, a violation of the Word of God. But now here is Christ. Uh, who is marrying someone who had been married? There are three. There are three spiritual marriages in the Bible. One was the marriage of, of of God to ancient Israel as a nation. The second one is is that every human being spiritually is married to the law of God. We are, we understand that from. Uh, Romans chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 every human being is married to the law of God and uh, and when every time we sin uh, we are uh, engaging in spiritual fornication and that is one reason or that's another way of saying why we are subject to eternal damnation we are engaging in fornication because we're married to the law of God. But when Christ died for us, it means that we died. It's as if we have gone into hell and spend eternity in, in hell, they experience the second death, and come out as a new creature. And so now because we death has occurred in our life, a spiritual death that was performed on our behalf by Christ, we are now free to be married to Christ, that is to be the bride of Christ. The, a death has come in between the time when we were married to the law of God and now that we are married to Christ as our bridegroom. Okay, um, yeah, thanks. I'll have to think about that for it to all make sense, but um, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Uh, Brother Camping, I have a question. I've been uh, having problems with the parable in Luke 16. I think it's verses 1 through 13. You're talking about the rich man and Lazarus. No, it's, uh, it's the unjust steward, I think it is. Oh, the unjust steward. Okay, all right. Yes. Now, it is a, that is a on the face of it is a very difficult parable because the unjust steward, who is about to be fired, he's a wicked man, and he's he knows he's is uh, he's going to be fired because of his activities. But before he gets fired, he makes provision for as a livelihood after he is fired by. Uh, giving special uh, uh, special uh, privileges to some of the customers of the man he's working for, and uh, uh, one man owes fifty uh, for fifty uh, whatever, and he says or a hundred, and he says write down fifty. In other words, he cuts cuts their bills in half or in two th uh, cuts out one third off or something. He's making friends. He's preparing for the time when he is no longer going to be able to have this job. And then God gives, commends him that as he says in, uh, in uh, verse 8, the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. That is, he had done wisely in the, in the setting of being, uh, in the setting of wickedness. For the children of this world, in their generation, that's the generation of evil, are they wiser than the children of light? Now, the children of light, they're the true believers. And now he's going to uh, use that as an illustration of how we who claim to be true believers are to prepare for the future. 
I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of righteousness. Now, the mammon of, uh, mammon of unrighteousness is money. Uh, that is, it is used for all kinds of unrighteous acts. It, it is not a spiritual uh, commodity, but it's something that we utilize. And by means of that, we are to make friends. Now, how do we make friends? By sharing the gospel with others. That, uh, that is, we utilize the money God has entrusted to our care, which is the mammon of unrighteousness. It's the money, the same money that the world uses for their unrighteous acts. And we use it to share the gospel that there might be those who will become saved. That, I'm reading now the rest of verse 9, uh, when ye fail, that is, when you die, they, that is, these who have become saved, because you have been faithful in, in utilizing the mammon of unrighteousness that God has entrusted to your care uh, to send the gospel out into the world, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And that's the way God wants the children of light or the true believers to face the future, to make provision that there will be others who will have become saved because we have been faithful in sharing the gospel in accordance with the command that God gave that we're to go into all the world with the gospel. And uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, but in, God is using as an illustration the wicked person in his, uh, in his uh, generation, in the generation of evil that he makes, pre makes provision for the future. So we do too, but it's an entirely different kind of provision. Right, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold Campen. Yes. Yes, can you turn to uh, Daniel 2, uh, verse 44, and can you explain that to me? Well, let's take a look. All right. Daniel 2, verse 44. Daniel 2, verse 44. We read, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kings, kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, the, the, uh, here is this image that is actually a representation of the kingdom of Satan. Notice the head of gold. God, God said, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Now, he, he represents Satan, who is the head of the kingdom of Satan. And the, and the stone that was carved out of the rock, uh, that was taken out of the rock, that is the kingdom of God headed up by the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and that kingdom that was set up uh, uh, from before the foundation of the world in one sense, uh, it was set up in another sense at the time that Christ went to the cross to pay for the sins of those that he came to save. And, and uh, it is a kingdom that will be an eternal kingdom, and it, it will destroy the kingdoms of the world. That is, it will... Finally, uh, 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 the true believers, along with Christ as their as a chief judge, will will bring uh, will judge all the unsaved of the world who are identified with this uh, with this uh, uh, this image headed up by gold, and that has been smashed, and uh, and it will end. All of that will end up in hell. So the kingdom that. Uh uh, that shall never be break. Can you compare that with uh, Jerusalem above? That's the kingdom that can't uh, ever be destroyed. Yes, that's okay. okay. That's and all, all right. the other kingdoms would be the local congregations of today that is going to be destroyed or well, already have anything been destroyed. that Satan uh, occupies the local congregations as well as the world itself, which is under his authority. Yeah, I've been reading this and reading it, and I've you know I'm looking at other verses, trying to compare scripture to scripture. And I, I, I couldn't find it, and I've been trying for a long time to, to get through, to, you know, to, to uh, get this question answered. So 
All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Harold, and well, uh, you have a good night. Thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing, Brother Camping? Very well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, what does it mean in the Bible when people say, God will make a way out of no way? That doesn't mean anything about uh, healing, you know, some kind of miraculous healing or changing your situation, does it? Well, if God doesn't do miraculous healing, he did it at the time. Christ did it at the time, and and he had a few others did it uh, during the Bible times as illustration of the fact that God is able to heal us, miraculously heal us from the disease of sin, which is infinitely more terrible than any physical disease. Right, that's true. And give us eternal life. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, God does not do any miraculous healing uh, today. That's not the nature of the gospel. The nature of the gospel is to heal us from our sin. Right, I, I agree with that. But I often wonder what people are really saying when he makes a way out of no way. Because a lot of times he won't. And I'm not saying this to be sound sacrilegious. But I think I'm correct on this. And you can tell me where I'm wrong. He, like if you're in a bad situation... Um, he'll, he won't uh, change it, and you have to go through it no matter what. Well, that's, uh, well, that's, that's correct? Well, uh, no, not entirely. First of all, that idea, uh, there, he'll make a way where there is no way. That's not a biblical statement, but it is a truism that the fact is that nothing can stop God. Now, uh, f uh, for example, uh, many, many believers, I know I've been in this situation where you get into a pickle of some kind in your business or in your whatever, uh, your relationships with other people, and you don't know which way to turn. You don't know what to do. Uh, you, uh, you just don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And, and uh, finally you wise up, hey, wait a minute, uh, God is in charge, isn't he? Uh, he... he, uh, he uh, uh, can uh, uh, let let him take over the problem, and so you finally learn to lean back on his almighty arms. And oh Lord, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. I just have to leave it to you. And you really let go. And and uh, all you know is God has given promises. Each morning His mercy is renewed. Uh, God will never leave us nor forsake us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and so on. We have those promises, but we just wait now upon the Lord. And then, seemingly, and this sometimes it means that we're going to go deeper into the problem. That's what God has planned for us. But on the other hand, there are times when seemingly uh, tomorrow or next week the problem s somehow vaporizes it disappears and uh, what looked like a threat today is no longer a threat and and uh, we wonder wow look how 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 this has developed and we uh, we had no idea that it could go in this way and uh, that's that's because God is God and he he uh, he, uh, there's nothing more comforting or comfortable or happy than when we get to that point where we let go and just leave it with the Lord and, and honestly just wait upon Him. And if it means, Lord, that I've got to go deeper into this morass, I've got to be chastised even more than I've been chastised, so be it, Lord, I wait upon You. And uh, that's, that's a wonderful place to come to in our personal uh, growth of spiritual growth with the Lord. Yeah, that's true. Just like I remember, maybe this is the same thing that you were saying, when I thought something was really bad and something bad was going to happen and it, and it didn't, right. somehow I got through it. And I wonder, how in the heck, how in the heck did I get through all that? Yeah. Is that not the same thing with your well, saying, right? Well, it's that's one aspect of that, of course. That of, is one aspect. And you see, first of all, we we are not in control of the situation. God, for example, if it involves other people, God can cause their mind them to change their minds. If it has to do with uh, some 
uh, issue of stupidity in our own minds. He can he can enlighten our minds. Uh, there, God has a million different ways to to uh, make a situation uh, turn out quite differently than it looks. If yeah, that's he true. So Isn't, that Isn't that wonderful? He can do that. Yep. And okay. thank you for calling yes, and sharing. But remember, God is not a servant. We come to Him in brokenness and and trusting, and and we wait upon Him, and we never dictate to Him. We never say, "Now, Lord, you gotta you gotta do it now." You just say, "Oh, Lord, uh, I can't do it. I I'm just waiting upon you, and you have to do what is pleasing to you." And I don't know what that is. I'm not I. I, I don't know what your plan is, but I know your plan is perfect, and, and I, I find that I, I'm uh, learning. I've just got to uh, lean on your almighty arms, and that's, that's where God brings us. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. If you'd forum. like to make... Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. I have two questions. Um, my first question is, um, it's a sin to drink wine, right? Well, the Bible doesn't uh, uh, just say it in, in that plain language. The, the best passage that we read about that is Proverbs chapter 31, where God says it is not for kings to drink wine or desire strong drink. And there is a literal... Uh, aspect of that that also has a spiritual aspect but uh, the fact is that uh, every true believer is a king we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies although we've been dispatched instantly to this world to serve as kingly ambassadors of the kingdom of God and uh, and uh, we know also that it is the world that utilizes wine to find their happiness or their uh, ability to face the rigors of this life. Uh, a, a glass of wine with a, with a meal will help them uh, take a little of the edge of, of the, uh, of the uh, severity of life away so that the food will digest a little bit better and so on. But God has given us a far better solution. In fact, it's the wine or, or champagne or, or the uh, 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 beer or whatever that brings happiness whenever uh, some kind of happiness, whenever the world gets together. The, uh, the uh, spiked punch or whatever, it, uh, it, the alcohol is, is, uh, helps to uh, lose some of the inhibitions and take some of the edge off of, this, of the strictness of life. But the true believer has another solution, and that is Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. I beseech you, uh, no, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord, and the peace of God that passeth understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, we can go directly to God and get strength from Him. We don't need the glass of wine. We don't need alcohol in order to make life more livable. Okay, um, my second question is, um, when Jesus was talking about His second return, uh, He said that no man would know the day, the hour, not the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but only the Father. But the problem is with that, I read in Revelations that Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, or something like that. And um, that tells me, he, you know, if there's like a contradiction there, because Jesus is the Son, he's God too. How would he not know when he's going to uh, return again? Well, you see, when we see that word no, immediately we think of time. But the day or the hour are also figures speaking about the action or the act of judgment. Judgment day or the hour of judgment. Now, who had to experience judgment? Angels that were from heaven that had fallen are in rebellion against God. They have to experience judgment. Mankind has to experience judgment. 
Christ had to experience judgment. When he is saying those words, he hadn't gone to the cross as yet. Remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? He, he was beginning to endure the wrath of God. So I think in that particular verse it is uh, focusing on the fact that uh, that no one uh, knows or has experienced judgment as yet. Now it is the Father uh, who is, uh, is uh, be, uh, although it's, Christ was also a high priest, uh, the minute we talk about God it gets very complicated because we don't understand God, but the Father is not emphasized as having to go to the cross. It is Christ who had to endure the wrath of God. Is um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are they like separate entities? Because remember it says in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. It's like plural. Are they like three separate beings? How does that, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand it either. Oh, okay. uh, very, very, uh, after all, our little peanut minds were not created to understand an infinite God. Uh, and so when God says there are uh, three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and uses plural pronouns like, uh, uh, let us make man in our image. And then at the same time, he says there is one God, and he uses singular program, uh, pronouns. I, I am Jehovah. And besides me, there is no Savior. And so we, uh, we say uh, that we can't reconcile those statements. Our minds are not capable of that. We just know it's true, but we can't, we can't understand it. Okay, thank you, Brother Campin. Thank you for calling and sharing. Let's take our last call. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Campin. Yes. Yeah, a guy called last night. He wanted to know, since the church age is over, what do the missionaries and the uh, churches, what's, what about their situation? And you, you didn't, I don't think he understood his question. But there's a, I think there's a good answer in Isaiah 49, verse 5 and 6. All right, let's quickly look at that. Isaiah 49, verse 5 and 6. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be God glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I also will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Well, I don't think this answers that question directly at all, uh, but it does speak about the gospel going out as a, uh, but you know, missionaries are part of the local congregation. They are sent out, they're supported by, they're under the authority of the local congregations. So they would have to stand in the same position with the church age as the local congregation. But now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.